Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's message. Our hope with this content is that it would help you come to know Jesus, follow Jesus, and lead others to do the same. If you're grateful for this word, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and also you can partner with what Jesus is doing here at Elevate City through giving. There's a link below for that as well. Here's today's message. I can't wait for you to hear it. Well, if you're new, my name is Joey, and I'm so pumped that you are here tonight. Um, Tonight, we are continuing a conversation that we started back in May, hit pause on this summer, but continue tonight. And uh, that conversation revolves around this question, who are Jesus people? Who are Jesus people? Like, what does it mean to be a Jesus person? Why would I want to be a Jesus person? Person, does following Jesus make any real difference in my life? And if you weren't here for volume one of this series, I want to encourage you to go back and watch those messages on YouTube because there may be some plot holes in the story that Jesus wants to write in your life without those messages. But tonight we continue this journey, and uh, I want to hear you say, Jesus people. people. And uh, the whole idea of this series is we are wanting to define and communicate what the Elevate City culture and vision and values are. We're wanting to let you know what this place is about and what we wanna see happen in your life when you step into being a part of this community of faith. This is like the dream that we have for this church. And so if there was ever a series to invite your friends to, this is it, because they're going to be able to get a crystal clear picture for the kind of people that we are and the story that Jesus is writing in the city of Sandy Springs. Amen? Um, tonight is like paramount. Tonight is central. It is foundational. It is utmost and foremost. And every other synonym for important that I could find on rhymezone.com, okay? Like tonight may be the most important. Like, hey, look right at me. I am begging you tonight, please don't go through the motions of church. Like I'm begging you tonight, don't think that you've already got this figured out. Like I want, I want you to know that this message has been messing with me as I've been preparing for it. It has been shaking things on my inside. It has been convicting me. And so I want for tonight to be a night where you don't just play the religious game of church and you don't just go through the motions And you don't think that you've got it all figured out, but that you really think deeply tonight. Like, I want you to do some soul searching tonight. Like, I want for you to dig down in, like, the deep parts of who you are and ask yourself some really hard, really difficult, really gut-level questions. If you grew up in church, then we're going to look at a story that's familiar, but I think that you need to see afresh I think you need to beg the Holy Spirit to give you a new picture for the story that we're gonna see tonight to shake the cobwebs off of your faith and to do something where he sets something on fire in your soul. So with that in mind, if you have your Bibles and I hope that you do Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, and let me give you some backstory on where we're going tonight. It's the last week of Jesus' life. In three days, Jesus will be dead. And so you've got to imagine that the contents of his conversation at this point in time are pretty important. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but people at the end of their lives don't tend to have a tendency of just shooting the breeze. And the same is true with Jesus. The conversation that we're getting ready to step into the middle of is actually the longest, most heated, recorded debate that Jesus experiences his entire life. A lot of people, when they look at this story, they look at it as if it is a snapshot singular instance, but it's actually part of a three chapter long debate. You see, there are these two peoples, these two religious sects, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they, although they don't disagree with, although they disagree with each other, they're even more disturbed by Jesus. They are trying to find out what Jesus' code is, what Jesus is all about, what his teaching really communicates. And so they're caught up in this religious debate with Jesus. And although these two groups don't agree with each other, they dislike Jesus even more. And so opposing forces have joined together to try to trick Jesus, to try to trap Jesus. You see, it's happened over and over where they would go to debate with Jesus on a certain issue, but walk away in defeat. 
And so now they're sending in reinforcements. They get a scribe, a lawyer, an expert on the Jewish judicial system and law and way of life to go to Jesus in order to trap him, to ask Jesus the most foundational question of them all. What is the greatest commandment? Translation, what is the most important part of life? And that's why we step into the scene tonight. Matthew chapter 2, 22, verse 34. We've already read it once tonight. Let's read it again. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and a second is like it. He quotes Leviticus 19, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. If you're taking notes tonight, I want for you to write at the top of your page, what's most important? What's most important? I want for you to turn to your neighbor and say, what's important? If they say you, ask them on a date, okay? If they're like, you are important. Be like, well, you go on a date with me then, right? What's most important? important. This is like the question of life, isn't it? Like what really matters in the end? What is worth in this short time that we're here on the planet, giving the limited amount of time and energy and resources to? Like what is our purpose? Like while there's breath in our lungs, how should we be spending our days? What's really important? I mean, we're all normal people fighting through this thing called life, right? We're fighting all of the struggles of every day. We're fighting to try to climb the corporate ladder and we're fighting through life trying to find the one and we're fighting to try to find true fulfillment and we're fighting to raise kids and we're fighting Atlanta traffic, amen? We're just fighting. We're fighting to try to get out from under those student loans and we're fighting to try to save up enough money to put down a down payment and we're fighting economics and we're fighting to be able to save up enough for retirement. We're just fighting through life. And some people would go, well, Joey, that's, that's not what's important. Money is not what's important. Money is not important in this life. Have you ever noticed that it's always people who have some that say that? Like you ain't never heard a broke dude go, money, it doesn't matter, sir. Uh, I got a mortgage payment coming up, but I'm just living on love, right? It's always people who are rich, are like, money, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, okay, well, I would just like to try it and see for myself. So if I could just like hold that for a second, like, let me see if it's not important. We say things, we have this tendency, don't we? This propensity of saying things aren't important, of coming to spaces and places like this and going, oh, that's not important. But then when we leave spaces and places like this, the very things that we say are not important become the very things that grab a hold of our emotions and take us hostage. Have you noticed that? That the things that we would categorically say aren't that important become the things that affect our mood and that we attach our anxieties to and plan our schedule around and dictate how we spend our money and do everything else. The things that we would categorically say aren't that important. And so then when you add to it the pace that we live at in this modern world, just how fast life is going and all the messages from all the marketers that are coming at us every single day telling you, you gotta have this, this dress. You're not gonna fit into fall fashion without it. And you gotta get these new sneakers and you gotta have that new car and motorized cars. They're not the rage anymore. You gotta have an electric car because if you don't, you won't have friends and nobody will like you and you won't get into heaven in the end. And so then all of a sudden, everything's important. 
And if everything's important, then nothing's important. And that's essentially where this Pharisee, this scribe is. He's going, Jesus, there's 613 Jewish commands. Which one do I have to pay attention to? What's most important? And so if you are a Jesus person tonight or you're interested in exploring what it might mean if you became a Jesus person tonight, you're like, I'm trying to tip my toes into that and see like, what does that mean? I wanna tell you tonight what Rabbi Jesus said was most important three days before he died. What he said was greatest, what he said was most, what he said was important. He said that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now this is mind blowing. This is like earth shattering. For us, it's become typical and predictable and like it's played on repeat. But this is mind blowing when you stop to think about it. The king of the cosmos has everybody on the edge of their seats and the stage has been set, what is most important? He could demand anything, require anything that he wants in this moment. And yet what does he ask for? He does not ask these Pharisees for a set of religious expectations. He asks for wholehearted relationship. He goes, I want relationship with you, Jesus said the most important thing in all of life is to be in this love relationship with God and with people. This should change how you see what you think God wants from you tonight. This should totally shift the picture. Like, do you know, do you know what I want from my mechanic? I want him to fix my car. You know what I want from my lawn service? No weeds. You know what I want from my barber? Hair like Thomas Cheeseman. (laughs) I want those people to perform a service for me. Do you know what God wants from people? Relationship. Relationship. He is not looking for these Pharisees to perform some religious expectations. He is not looking for them to dot I's and cross T's. He goes, I want relationship. Now, hold on because I do not want for you to have an image of God in your mind tonight where he is like a 13 year old girl on Instagram posting selfies of himself every day, just hoping that you'll love him and like him. That's not what God is like. He's not like, will you please love me? God is not like Jerry Maguire, okay? If you know the movie, Jerry Maguire, Renee Zellweger, they're in the elevator and he makes the little hand motion, you complete me. You do not complete God. The opposite is actually the case. Jesus is communicating. It is only when you completely love God that you will be complete. That your life comes together when you realize that its intention and its purpose is to love him. Did you know that you are created to love something It's the reason that you can't stop scrolling on those dating apps because you're just looking for someone to love. You don't know why you can't stop scrolling, but the reason you you can't stop scrolling is because you are looking for someone to love. It's the reason that you keep lowering your standards and dating people who do not have the same values that you do. It is the reason that you're working so hard to try to get the approval of a boss that doesn't even know your name because you are looking for someone to love that you think can complete you, but the only one who can complete you is the one who created you. And until you understand that what is most important is for you to love him with everything that you've got, life will not make sense. This is the secret to life that Jesus people know, but that the rest of the world is just sleepwalking through life, totally oblivious to. Life is not about stuff 
or significance. It is not about saving the environment. It is not about technology or the economy or politics. It is not about bigger houses or nicer cars or more things. It is not about traveling the world or having experiences. It is about relationship. You were made for relationship with the living God. And until you get in your mind that everything else is secondary and a trivial and an empty, vain pursuit, life won't make sense. This is the secret that Jesus' people know that so many people miss. You know, being a parent is so wild. So wild. We are just like drowning most of the time, okay? If I'm honest, is that okay to be honest? that most of the time we're just like, what do we do? And this is a lot and someone please send help, AKA babysitting, hashtag love your pastor as you love yourself, okay? Like <laughs> parenting is a lot, but I keep trying to tell Kayla, these are the days. These are the days. Like let's try not to wish them away so quickly. Let's try not to just hope that they get out of diapers and that they start to be able to pee in a toilet. And let's, let's try to stop just wishing these moments away and let's just be present. Like, let's just cuddle a little bit longer. Let's enjoy these like little moments and their little giggles and their little steps and these pillow forts. And let's, let's enjoy the fact that our house is always messy. Like our bedroom is messy and our living room is messy and our car is messy. Will our car ever be clean again? I don't think so. But I'm just trying to go, these are the days, like let's enjoy it. Do you know why? Because I've never met the dad who goes, yep, read too many bedtime stories. Yep, sang too many lullabies. I'm at the end of my life, and as I look back, I answered too many of their silly questions. I cuddled a little bit too long. I hung out in their room and prayed with them and sat on the floor with them, and that's my great regret in life. I've never met that dad. And likewise, I've never met the Christian. I've never met the Jesus person who gets to the end of their life and goes, you know, I prayed too much. I sat in God's presence too much. I've never met the Jesus person who is at the end of their life and they go, I fasted too much. I sang him too many songs. I wrote in my journal too many love letters to my king. I said no to so many silly boys to sit with him. And I just regret that. I just wish that I would have been out there more in the club doing my thing. I've never met that Jesus person. I've never met the Jesus person who's at the end of their life and going, you know, I wish I would have kept more money for myself and not given more of it to him. I've never, I've never met the Jesus person who's like, yeah, you know, now that I'm getting ready to stand before the king of kings, the creator of the cosmos of all that is, and give an account for the things that I've done, I wish I was a little more subdued. I wish I'd have played a little bit more hard to get with Jesus. I wish I wasn't like, I shouldn't have been so passionate. I shouldn't have told as many people about his insane love. I shouldn't have wasted everything on the only thing that's gonna matter in the end. I've never met that person. Do you know why? Because relationship with Jesus is where life is found. It's where life is found. You will spend the rest of your life searching to find what you can only find in him. Relationship with Jesus is the place of no regrets. It's the place of contentment. It's the place of fulfillment. It's the place of joy, unparalleled joy. It's the place of shalom, of peace, of depth, of wholeness. It's the place where small living ceases and the kingdom expands. It's the place that you were created for and that you were made for relationship with the living God. Living to love Jesus is where life is found. But if I'm honest tonight, I've been wondering this week, where have all of the people who are in love with Jesus gone? Where are the people who say, you can have all of this world, just give me Jesus. Where are the people who say one pure and holy passion, one magnificent obsession to know and follow you 
He's all I want. He's all that I need. Where have those people gone who are crazy in love with Jesus? I don't know what you came in here tonight thinking that God wanted from you. I don't know if you came in here tonight thinking that he wanted your money or thinking that he wanted your religion or thinking that he wanted a couple of hours on a Sunday. But I want for you to leave tonight knowing that what he wants is your heart. He wants your heart. He's after your heart all over again, pursuing you, chasing you down, saying, I want your heart. And I want all of it. I want all of it. I want your heart. The greatest commandment, the most important thing in life is to know that what Jesus wants is your heart. Listen, some of us, are on the verge of a spiritual heart attack tonight. Our arteries, they are so clogged with lust and ambition and busyness and secondary things that there's no place in our heart for King Jesus right now. And I'm begging that the Holy Spirit would do heart surgery tonight because it's not just our heart that is clogged, it's our minds that are cluttered. We got these minds that are so full of information, so full of these like half-truths that are watering down, shallowing and emptying the greatest commandment of its power. And what my prayer is tonight is that the Holy Spirit would come and do heart surgery to give us a new heart and a new understanding of what the greatest commandment is actually about. And it's that God is after our hearts. Do you know what's so tragic? What is so tragic is that we have taken one of the wildest, most dangerous, revolutionary things that Jesus ever said, and we have sanitized it We've made it safe and we've made it cliche. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. You've seen the bumper sticker, right? You've heard the message if you've been in church before. Just love God, love people. Love God, love people. Real simple, love God, love people. And if you haven't heard it in church, you've probably seen it in culture, right? Probably maybe on a Facebook argument or a Twitter argument where a pastor speaks into something that creates a little controversy. He calls into question some of the things that are happening in our culture. He injects truth into a, a space of relativity. And all of a sudden, what do people say to that pastor? Oh, that's not being loving. It's not very loving. I thought we were just supposed to love God and love people. Is that loving? You're supposed to be tolerant. You're supposed to be a Christian, right? We're just supposed to love each other. Like, can't we all just get along, sing kumbaya, love God, love people? We make it this thing that is like what Jesus is after is just us to like hang out with him a little bit. Like we've got this tragic misinterpretation and application that falls so short of what Jesus really intended in the greatest commandment. What we do is we turn it into this pithy statement from hippie Jesus who's like sitting under a tree sipping decaf oat milk, green tea latte, hippie Jesus. And we turn the greatest commandment into thinking that what Jesus wants to do is make this pinky promise with us where we'll like spend some time with him when it's convenient and we'll love people because love is the answer. We really water it down into this bumper sticker that we slap on things so that we don't ever have to walk in obedience or really deal with our relationship with God. We take what Jesus tried to do and we just turn it into this weird rule because rules are easy to follow. Relationship is really difficult. And Jesus is going, it is so much more than that. This is not hippie Jesus. This is not green tea Jesus. This is black coffee Jesus, okay? This is man on a mission Jesus. Second the record straight Jesus. Drop truth bombs Jesus. This is savage Jesus. Revolutionize everything Jesus. This statement is get himself killed Jesus. Like, I want to dig deep for a second. Are you okay with that? Do you know what happens next? <laughs> Do you know where the story goes from here? Like, I want for you to hang tight because they don't tell you this part in Sunday school, okay? 
If you kept reading what happens after the greatest commandment, I want for you to know that that three chapter long debate comes to a screeching halt. It's over. Look at what Matthew chapter 22, 46 says. Jesus asks them one question, and then this is the response. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Whoa. I thought this was supposed to be the let's all play nice and get along and kumbaya verse in the Bible. I thought this was the bumper, stick verse, bumper sticker verse in the Bible. But all of a sudden, Jesus' response to their question leaves nobody else asking any more questions. What Jesus says is so significant that no one wants to, oh, I don't want to ask that guy anything else. I don't want to know what he's going to say next. Because there is such weight that is attached to it. This doesn't make it seem like what Jesus' pursuit was in the greatest commandment is a shallow, superficial relationship with God and us just all getting along. Seems like he's after something more, church. If you keep on reading, immediately following, Jesus goes on to monologue for an entire chapter about the difference between empty religion and the heartfelt relationship that he's after. For an entire chapter, he monologues. After that, he monologues about the final judgment and the end of the world. After that, if you keep on reading, the religious establishment starts their plot to kill Jesus in Matthew chapter 26. This is the spark that ignites the explosion of the crucifixion. From this point moving forward, it's false accusations, fake trials that leads to Jesus' death. Do you know why? Because the greatest commandment is dangerous. It's not safe. It's not sanitized. It changes everything. You see what the greatest commandment did? Yes, it simplified the law. But it also exponentially raised the stakes. Think about this, all of the law and all of the prophets hang on these two commands. All of the law and all of the prophets hang on these two commands. Jesus just simplified and codified it, 613 Jewish commands. He reduced 613 that Moses reduced down to 10 to two. And he goes, there's two, two things. It's a buy one, get one deal, free kind of situation, okay? Like, it's really easy. Two questions on the test. You get two questions right, you get the whole test right. You make two mortgage payments, whole thing's paid off. Anyone in? Everyone's in, right? Yes. What is it, Jesus? But So he simplified it, but he also elevated it. Because if you get those two things wrong, you get everything wrong with it. So what Jesus did is he raised the stakes. You see, contrary to popular belief, Jesus does not minimize the law. He magnifies the fact that we can't keep it. We can't keep it. There are 613 Jewish laws. We couldn't keep them. There were 10 commandments. We couldn't keep them. There were two commandments. Guess what? We can't keep those either. And that's where the beauty of the gospel steps in. That because we are unable to love God the way he commands, and yet Jesus still loves us. It's the incredible beauty of the gospel. Do you know what we miss in our modern day reading of the greatest commandment? I think we may emphasize the wrong word. We emphasize the word love, and I'm not saying that love shouldn't be emphasized. But love isn't even the most repeated word in the greatest commandment. It's all. All, all, not some, not a little, not what's convenient, all, total, complete, all, every little ounce, all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. If we included Mark's version, all your strengths, four times all, not some or most all, every inch, every ounce, every fiber, hopelessly, totally, completely loving God. Well, that sounds like a weight. <laughs> that sounds pretty difficult. And then he defines it. He says, all your heart. Let me hear you say heart. heart. Now, the heart would be like the sum of who you are. It's like your personality. The totality of your person is what your heart is. And so your heart would be evidenced by what you talk about most. You know what would be really weird? 
is if you and I were like friends and we hung out for like a year and a year into our friendship, I like brought up my wife, Kayla, and you went, wait, you're married? That would be really weird, right? Because you talk about who you love in your heart, who is involved in your life. It just comes up, it comes up to the surface and he's going, okay, do you love him with your heart? Because from the overflow of the mouth, the heart speaks. Do you love Jesus with your heart? How often are you talking about Jesus? Like in your conversations, in your relationships, in your friendships, at work, with your family, on social media, the content of your conversations, if people listen in, would they know who you care about in your heart? But your heart is not just who you are and what you speak about. What you speak about. The biblical idea of heart is this idea of your will or your devotion or your commitment. Like love has feelings, but love is much more than a feeling. And according to the Bible, our command is not to like fall in love or to be in love. It's to walk in love. And walking is a choice. It's a commitment. It's a deliberation. And I'm sure that there are days when, okay, probably one day when Kayla woke up and didn't want to love me. All right, I'm sure it happened one time. But do you know what she did? She didn't go, oh, my feelings aren't telling me whether or not I love Joey. She's going, no, I'm going to choose to love Joey. And Jesus is going, I want for you to love me with all of your choices. I want for you to love me when you don't feel like it. I want for you to love me when you don't want to, when you wake up and you're groggy. I want for you to love me with all of your heart. But he doesn't just say all of your heart. He says all of your soul all of your soul. And the biblical idea of soul would be the place of your emotions and your affections and your passion. He doesn't just want you to love him in a way that is like arms crossed and subdued. Now, I'm not saying that passion always has to look like jumping or dancing or singing, but if you are more emotionally affected by the way that a 22-year-old college student handles a ball than you are the living of God, there's a problem. If you get more excited when a grown man in tight pants crosses an imaginary line, then you are what Jesus has done for you. I'm wondering, do you love him with all of your soul? And he doesn't just say all of your soul, but he says with all of your mind, your brain, your thoughts, your intellect, which is like a big problem because there seems to be this anti-intellectualism in modern day Christianity where we don't want to think deeply about the things of the Lord. We want, want to deal with doctrine or theology. We don't want to memorize scripture. We don't want to have theological debates. There seems to be this anti-intellectualism in modern day Christianity. And I'm just going, where are those of us who are loving him with our mind? Because it is really hard to love somebody that you know nothing about. And Jesus is going, I want for you to love me with all of your mind. I want for you to read books about me and listen to podcasts about me and fill your mind with sound doctrine. I want for you to think deeply about the things of the Lord. I want for you to love me with your mind. And I want for you to know, like, if you're ever wondering, like, how, how do I do that? How do I spend time with him? How do I sit in his presence? How do I figure that out? Like, go through Equip, talk to one of the pastors on staff, because this is, like, what we live for, to teach people how to read the Bible and know God through his word, to be able to engage their mind and engage their heart and engage their soul. But he doesn't just say, love me with all of your heart or with all of your soul or with all of your mind. He says, with all of your strength, too with your body, with your physical self, with your flesh and your actions. Love God in everything you do. Love God in work and at work. Love God in parenting and at home. Love God on a run. Love God at the gym. Love God in the car and on vacation and while you sleep. Love him everywhere. Give him everything that you got. Is anybody else feeling like maybe I don't love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength and I can't keep the greatest commandment tonight? Am I the only one who's listening to this guy preach up here going, bro, that sounds like a lot. This doesn't seem as simple as maybe they told me it was in Sunday school. Sounds like a lot of pressure. I don't know if I love God with everything. I think I might just give him my leftovers. I might not love God wholeheartedly. I might love him real half-heartedly. 
I might not be committed to him. I might just give him my convenience. And I'm wondering if maybe there is this correlation in this connection between life not working and us not living out the greatest commandment. Us not prioritizing the thing that's most important is producing a life that none of us wants. A life that is stressed out, maxed out, tapped out. A life that is void of purpose and meaning and depth. A life that moves towards addiction and shallowness. Could it be? But it's because we're not leaning into the greatest commandment. And you're just going, bro, I don't know if I could do this. I don't know if I could keep this. And I want you to know that that's a problem because we ain't even talked about loving your neighbor as yourself yet. And that's a problem because a lot of us don't even know our neighbor's names, much less love them as we love ourselves. Could you imagine for a second how different the relationships would be in your life if you actually loved your neighbor as yourself? Because here comes Jesus like sounding the alarm and he's going, hey, hey, lest you think that what I'm after is you just hanging out in your prayer closet, hanging out a little holy huddle and sitting in a Christian bubble and waiting for the rapture to happen. I want for you to know the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. How different would life be if you loved your neighbor as yourself? <laughs> like think about the way that you love yourself. You put up with yourself in ways that ain't nobody else would. Like you put up with your, you forgive yourself, you tolerate yourself, you stay there when yourself smells, like you treat yourself real good. Like, could you imagine if you put up with other people's quirks the way that you put up with your own quirks? If you really loved, like what kind of forgiveness and what kind of love and what kind of depth and what kind of like closeness and intimacy would you experience if you really loved your neighbor as yourself? That this command happens eight times. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Over and over and over again, God, Jesus, they're saying, I want for you to express love for me by the way that you love people. Jesus says, a new command I give you to love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is what I find so compelling tonight is that what Jesus did by when this lawyer asked him for the greatest commandment, but he said to and kind of combined them together is what he communicated to us is that the evidence that God is looking for, for whether or not we really love him is most clearly communicated by how we treat his kids, by what we do for people. You see, you can do something nice for me and that's great. I'll give you a high five. Fist bump, appreciate it. You do something for my kids and I will never forget it. And he, Jesus, by adding this other commandment is going, do you really wanna love me? Do you really wanna give me your heart and your mind, your soul and your strength? Love people, give your life to serve people to help people, walk with people. And if you were to read Luke's account of this story, you would see that the lawyer then asks, well, then who then is my neighbor? Who do I have to love? Because we're always looking for a loophole. We're always looking for a way out. And Jesus goes on to tell a story, the story of the Good Samaritan. And if I were to summarize the message of that story, what Jesus communicates in that story is everyone. You've got to love everyone, people who don't look like you or talk like you or live where you live or vote like you or think like you or dress like you or have the same color skin. You've got to love everyone. And that's how I know if you love me. Because life without love, Jesus says, you're just a noisy gong. You're a clanging cymbal. You're just noise. You're just talk. You ever known somebody who's just all talk? All talk. This was the thing in high school, right? You'd be playing basketball and somebody would walk up and they'd have the shoes, they'd have the clothes, they'd have the jersey, and they'd be talking about basketball and what happened last night in the NBA. Hey, all right, so are we gonna play? No, 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 man, I gotta pull a hammy. I gotta pull a hammy, like not today, not today, maybe next week. Like, they were just all talk, right? Just running their mouth. I love God. I love God. No, I really, really love God. I promise I love God. Like, I really do. I care about God more than I can put into words. Not if, 
Not if you don't love people. Like you can say, but, but Joey, no, no, no. But I, I do, I read my Bible and I pray and I sometimes every other month serve on the community team and I get to church at 545 every week. Do you love people? Do you love people? Like, do people have your heart? Because if people don't have your heart, God says that he doesn't have your heart. But you're just a loud gong. You're a clanging cymbal. Your love for him is just talk. All right, so let's do it. If you were honest tonight after listening to a message like this, and I know you're not supposed to be honest because we're in church, but if you were, <laughs> how much do you see the direction and devotion and intention and primary purpose of your life being about loving God and loving people? Like not as a cute bumper sticker slogan, but as the driving force behind everything and anything that you do. How much are you waking up in the morning going, I just wanna know him more. Like, are you thinking, I just wanna serve God today. I wanna love God today. I wanna honor God today. I wanna make a big deal about God today. Like, I wanna surprise God. I know I can't because he's sovereign and he knows everything, but like, if I could, I would wanna surprise him. I would wanna like throw a surprise party and catch him off guard and like have an anniversary for the day of my salvation and tell him how much I love him. I wanna, wanna throw him a birthday party. Oh wait, that's Christmas. We already do that. But like, I just want him to know how much I love him. How much are you like sitting in your car just wondering, I wonder what God's thinking about. I wonder what God wants for my life right now. God, thank you. I'm so grateful for what you've done. When's the last time that you were just like, man, I'm just, I, I gotta tell him thank you. And I'm just gonna tell him thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me food on my table. And thank you for giving me a community. And thank you for not giving up on me because I've given up on you a whole lot. I've walked away from you a whole lot. I've doubted your plans for my life a whole lot, but thank you for never giving up on me. How much do you see? Like your life being about Jesus, more of Jesus. I just wanna know Jesus and be close to Jesus and tell more people about the radical, scandalous, unbelievable love of Jesus. I want to know his love and live in his love. I wanna give him more of me, not less of me. I'm not trying to give him leftovers. I'm trying to see how much I can, how little I can live on so that I can give him more. How many of us are really living in the greatest commandment? How many of us see this as the fight of our lives. We fight for so many things that aren't important and I'm afraid that in today's version of Christianity, there is a lack of fight for the thing that's most important. Now, let me be extremely clear tonight. Let me tell you what you're not fighting for. You're not fighting for God to love you. You're not fighting for his acceptance of you. You're not fighting so that he notices you. You're not fighting so that he approves of you. You're not fighting so that he accepts you. You are fighting to love him because he fought to love you. You see, you don't first love God. God first loved you. And God sent Jesus to become our neighbor and to love his neighbor as himself, gave up everything for you. That's what the cross is all about, is it's God's demonstration of I will hold nothing back. I will give you my only firstborn son to prove to you that I will go all in, all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind, on the table to love you. And the fight of our life becomes, Jesus, I just wanna love you back. Jesus, I just wanna love you back. Jesus, I just want to love you back. I want to make this the laser focus of my life, the filter that I make every decision through that although I know I'll never be able to, I wanna spend the rest of my life doing everything that I can to love Jesus. Like this is what makes the gospel so scandalous. We can't keep 613, we can't keep 10, we can't keep two and he loves us still. Does that not make you want to love him more tonight? Does that not make you want to give him more tonight? The fact that he still hasn't given up on you. He's simplified it. He's reduced it. He's just put it right before you in crystal clarity. And we still can't do it. And he still loves you. I, uh, I really like bonfires. This is my segue to close, if you can't tell. 
And uh, there's just something for me about like sitting by a bonfire and just some of the conversations that you have, the things that come up, the questions that get asked, they're just really beautiful. I just, I love to look at a fire, Bear grills. He says, fire is like nature's television. I can just look at it, just gaze at it. But you know, the thing about a fire is fires always go out. They always run out of something to burn on. They always run out of wood to burn up. And eventually the fire grows cold. In uh, Matthew chapter 24, just two chapters later from the greatest commandment, Jesus says, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. And I just wonder if your love for Jesus has grown cold tonight. Because I came here to try to start a bonfire. I came here to just try to do everything that I can with all the passion and sweat inside of me. To try to wake something up, to wake you up and tell you that he's after your heart. To rekindle the fire of your faith tonight. To remind you of his insane love for you and to ask you if your life makes sense at all in light of it. I came here to just try to stir up your affections and your emotions and to ask yourself, am I fighting for relationship? Is there any fight in me for God? Because he sure fought for me when he sent his son. And he sure fought for me when I turned away. And he sure fought for me when I gave up on church. And he sure fought for me when I wanted to throw in the towel and walk away and leave and call it quits because it's hard. And he sure fought for me when I doubted myself. And he sure fought for me when I stumbled and sinned. And so am I just going to give in and call it quits or am I going to fight for the only thing that matters in the end? I'm fighting up here for your faith, church, because culture's fighting for it. It's fighting for your attention and it's fighting you to live small lives to live for things that aren't gonna matter in the end. I just want for you to know that loving Jesus will, it will, you won't regret it. It won't be wasted. You won't be disappointed. You won't live a small life. You'll live a beautiful life, the life that you were created for. You know, if there was ever a Jesus person, I think many would agree that it'd be Billy Graham. Billy Graham famous evangelist communicated the gospel to billions of people. There was one time where he went into communist Russia to tell people about the love of Jesus and only one person from every family could come and they brought boom boxes and they recorded it because they wanted to take this message back home to their families. Billy Graham gave his life. He traveled the world telling people about the love of Jesus. But do you know what I find so interesting? Billy Graham was asked his greatest regret in life. And Billy Graham said this at the end of his life. He said, the thing that I regret the most is I wish I would have spent more time getting to know Jesus rather than just telling people about him. I think that what Billy Graham knew is that one day this life is gonna end and you're gonna step into eternity and you're gonna stand before God and there's gonna be this interaction. Are you gonna know him? Are you gonna love him? Are you gonna be able to say you are my first and my most? I gave you my heart and my mind and my soul and my strength. I gave you everything because I knew that what you wanted was my heart.